I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'd like to explore something with you that is on my mind, and I think the minds of many people, in very concrete ways. How to deal with people uh, that we have conflicts with of various kinds. Maybe minor little tiffs uh, with people you love, maybe major tiffs with people you love, and sometimes major tiffs with people you don't love. Uh, including in our very politically uh, intense era, certainly in America these days. Uh, how do we deal with all that um, without letting the poisons of hatred, vengeance, cruelty, malice, and so forth invade our hearts and remain? How do we do all that? And so I'm going to be engaging that question actually in a workshop that you might be interested in um, that I'm gonna do as a fundraiser for the Global Compassion Coalition. So it's in a good cause. And I think I did, yes. And I put the information about that um, in the chat previously. Um, you might be really interested in that workshop. I am. In three hours, I've really put together some fundamental material about compassion in conflicts that has to include effective ways of standing up for ourselves, on the basis of which there's a lot more room to recognize the suffering in others, even those we oppose or who have mistreated us. So that material is very practical. It's very down to earth. I've been reflecting a lot about it, including in my own personal life. And then meanwhile, out of the blue, today somebody emailed me a poem from Jane Hirschfield that I'd read, I'm sure, years ago and liked and then forgot. And it's a remarkable poem that creates a kind of context for this larger discussion. So I've put the poem itself into the chat. And um, because the chat sidebar will constrict uh, the actual lines of the poem, um, I'm um, going to put it in the general chat so you can see it as well. And whoops, here we go. Great. And I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it and then kind of riff on it and then bring it down to earth a little bit. Uh, and, um, and then we can explore it together maybe with some questions in particular situations. So the poem itself, uh, I'm sure I will not do it justice, and I'm, I hope there's a recording of Jane herself reading it. So Salt Heart, Jane Hirschfield. I was tired, half sleeping in the sun. A single bee delved the lavender nearby, and beyond the fence, a trowel's shoulder knocked a white stone. Soon the ringing stopped, and from somewhere a quiet voice said the one word, surely a command, though it seemed more a question, a wondering perhaps, what about joy? So long it had been forgotten, even the thought raised surprise. But however briefly, there, in the untuned devotions of bee and the lavender fragrance, the murmur of better and worse was unimportant. From next door, the sound of raking, and neither courage nor cowardice mattered. Soon enough, that gate swung closed. The world turned back to heart salt of wanting, heart salts of will and grief. My friend would continue dying, at last only exhausted, his wrists, even his wrists, thinned with pain. The river suffering would take what it wished of him, then go. And I would stay and drink on, as the living do, until the rest 
would enter into that water. The lavender swept in, the bee, the swallowed labors of my neighbor. The ordinary moment swept in, whatever it drowsily holds. I begin to believe the only sin is distance, refusal, all others stemming from this. Then come, rivers, come, irrevocable futures, come, come even joy, even now, even here, and though it vanish like him. Wow. For me, in that poem, including the piercing of its ending, is these two truths side by side. Um, and by the way, I'm not trying to reduce the magnificence of this poem in the many, many ways of approaching it. And considering it, and 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 feeding on it, uh, to just two things. That said, what there is, at least for me, in this is this combination of the river, call it the river of suffering, the river of dukkha, the river of reality, actually the river of time, the the unfolding expansion of the universe including all things, there is that into which everything will vanish. Thoughts vanish into the river of time. Uh, bodies, bees, lavender, stones, friends, all of it, poems, poems too, vanishing into all that. It all vanishes, right? It all empties out into everything. So what's the point of anything? And yet, there is a point in joy. There is a point in smelling the lavender and hearing the bee and loving our friend who is dying. Both together. And in that way, I think wisdom is to, um, over time, following the, the paths laid out by our teachers, who all converge on the intersection of wisdom and love and embody it increasingly in their own lives on that path that they have laid out before us and we are now walking ourselves and, and perhaps offering to others too, uh, there, there is this opening, this opening into a vastness, a, vast, a vastness filled with love, while at the same time needing to deal with the very particular situations we find ourselves in, in which other people let us down, attack us, vote for things that harm millions, if not billions of people, do all kinds of stuff, both, both. You know, much as um, the trowel and the bee and the lavender and the, the friend's wrists are particular and important, in much the same way, the ways in which that, um, <coughs> the ways in which that and the actions of others that are harmful, hurting us and hurting other people and other non-human beings, those all really matter too. And it's interesting that um, we have the poem, also the lines from T.S. Eliot, you've heard me offer, uh, teach us to care and not to care. I think in the not to care, in a sense, is the vastness of the unfolding of everything emptily. That's fully true, right? While at the same time, teach us to care 
about our boundaries, about our needs, about our rights, about the impacts of on, on others, teach us to care. I stumbled across a statistic that you may already know, which is that in the world today, roughly a million people a year die of mosquito-borne illnesses. Now, where does that actually happen? It doesn't happen very much in, in America, my country, and it really doesn't happen very much in America for those who have the privilege of access to good and often expensive medical care. Uh, where it happens is mainly elsewhere in the world in which people are still dealing with the legacy of the resources and wealth and fruits of labor that were extracted for them over centuries and centuries and centuries, uh, and in many, many cases, shipped north. And here they are. So for whatever the reasons are, all of it, wow, a million people a year dying of mosquito-borne illnesses that are obviously preventable because that is largely prevented in the developed countries of the world. Wow, that really matters. And I care about it. I have no problem caring about it. I have no problem caring about the fact that 10,000 kids a day die of hunger-related causes, a very established, credible statistic. So how do we balance these two? As the poet writes, how do we be aware that everything vanishes eventually in the river of time, suffering included, by the way. And at the same time, it matters, right? It matters. To me, that's a wisdom frame that's so central here. It's not abstract, it's not woo-woo, it's not metaphysical. It's how it actually is, isn't it? We can both go wide and go particular. And interestingly, the going wide in the heart with a kind of nonspecific um, goodwill and open-heartedness that radiates in all directions unconditionally through which others move. Um, our relationships with them may well be conditional based on what they do, but the fundamental stance of a commitment to decency and not being poisoned by hatred, that can be unconditional, not based on external conditions. Um, the resting in that actually makes us more effective when we need to assert ourselves. And remarkably, it's often by really going into the particular, as a lot of meditative training in the Buddhist tradition does, absorption into the particular sensations of the breath around the upper lip. It's amazing that absorption into the particular and attention to the particular, even a kind of devotion to it, a cherishing of it, that then can bring us into a sense of its relatedness to everything, opening really wide into everything. So we have the balance, right? So I invite you, the next time someone really bugs you, um, <clears throat> to touch base with yourself and ask, okay, where's the aspect of spaciousness in my mind? Can I find spaciousness? Can I find a sense of big picture, opening, a spaciousness in which things are happening, I'm not denying anything that's happening, but I'm finding the element of spaciousness in real time. Okay? And at the same time, can I find a sense of that spaciousness being infused in some ways with love or just simply open-heartedness, good-heartedness? You know? Can I find that? And I think you will find, and I could make a neurological case for this, that when you do, you're gonna be much more effective in that conflict.
much more able, you know, um, to assert yourself effectively and to be patient, to let silly little stuff go by while being grounded and, and effective and grave when it comes to talking about the big stuff. Right? Little checklist, little question. Um, is there spaciousness? Can I find a sense of spaciousness? Okay. And can I find a sense of a lovingness in the spaciousness? And we trained in this, in the meditation, kind of spacious presence with a sense of an open heart. Really effective the next time the oatmeal starts to fly. For one, it'll bring you immediately out of a kind of self-contraction. Spaciousness does that immediately. Finding your kind of non-specific um, establishing of caring and kindness and openness, that helps immediately, right? And then it's time to get into the particulars, isn't it? So then the question becomes, how do we not use this woo-woo, spacious love, river of time stuff to avoid or bypass dealing with the real crud, with other people, other things, politically these days, you know, how do how do we how do we do that? Right. And to me, I want to invite you to consider a conflict with somebody. You know, it could be a mild to moderate one, not the worst person in your life, but a mild to moderate conflict. And pick an issue in it. This will help to ground this. It could be something you're working on these days. So um, I'm gonna do it with you. Maybe something that kind of annoys you or they keep doing this thing and it bugs you. <laughs> and you've talked about it and they keep doing it. Um, or, you know, it could be that there are people in your life you like whose politics just, you know, for you are kind of abhorrent. Like, what? All right? Okay. Pick a conflict. Maybe <clears throat> it's an adult child who doesn't call you as often as they should. Uh, or a friend who calls you way too much, <laughs> more, much more than they should, All right? And so then see what happens when <clears throat> you go into and you try to name to yourself, what is the particular, the particular thing that bothers you or that you wish were different, the particularness of it, kind of like Jane Hirschfield does, the particularness of the bee the trowel, the stone, knocking, the lavender, the thin wrists, the particular. And then what happens when you name the particular to yourself as what it is in a very specific way, not with a lot of story around it, just simple, like I wish they were more interested in what I'm saying. Maybe that's it. Or I wish they did not deny the fact of global warming due to human activity, particular. Or, you know, maybe at work, you know, the particular, very particular of Something like, I wish they would keep their word about what they say they will do by a deadline. Okay, see what happens when you name the particular to yourself. I know for me that as soon as I name the particular thing, first of all, the act of naming it is really helpful because it clarifies what it actually is. 
and it and it brings it into being a particular grain of sand, a particular illness in the poem, a particular sound like the bee. It becomes particular. And when it becomes particular, it doesn't seem so overwhelming. And it's not so turbocharged by everything else. It's just that thing. It's just the music being loud, the loudness, the loudness of the music. Deb's comment at five minutes past the hour. Kathy's comment. I wish she would not interrupt me. The interrupting is the particular. Right? And I, I find that the naming of the particular, as a poet does, and the knowing of it really, really, really is helpful. It's kind of weird, isn't it? That we get benefit in our conflicts with people when we both go really wide and then when we go really in. And the two together can be really, really helpful when we're trying to work something through with people. Yeah, this is really great. Um, you know, take a look at what's coming in the chat. Um, and what happens when you name it? You know, and can you name it in a way that by naming it, you become distinct from it? It's there, it matters, right? Um, you know, they, they, their music is loud, the loudness of it. All right. Then can we get some distance from the loudness of it? It, it lives in its own right. It's not ours. We don't have to react to it then. It's just, it's just a fact. Yeah, it's poignant. I wish my son cared more about me. I wish there was more caring in his mind for about me. All right. Can you find a way of naming the particular, whatever it is, that allows you to get some breathing room around it, get some air around it? So I think in a few minutes, it would be helpful if I could talk with one or two or three of you to bring it down to earth, all right? And I'm inviting you into something that's very fresh for me personally. So I may not be as bullet pointed about it as I can sometimes be. It's this exploration. It's an invitation into both vastness and specificity, right? And, and exploring the combination of the two, both the vastness that can be infused with love and the specificity of what is bothering you and what you're gonna do about it. One thing that can often happen, I think, is that when we name the particular, we realize we can't do anything about it. You know, when you really name it, right? I wish they would develop class consciousness. You realize as worthy and wonderful as that is, um, I can't make them do it, you know? And so then the issue is that I have a desire that is not going to be fulfilled. What am I going to do about that? All right. Okay. So <clears throat> think about this combination. And it's an exploration experientially going to, out into the vastness of a kind, including a, a spaciousness of awareness and a non-specific good-heartedness. And then the particular issue that you're in conflict with someone about. Okay, Jerry, my friend Jerry, longtime steward of our meditation gathering, asking you to unmute. Great. Hi, Rick, how are you doing? Good, good. Good, good. So I, I have a friend who talks so much and he's brilliant and he's worth listening to, but he talks so much that I feel unheard. And I, I just I just figured this out just by, by uh, you know, I, I'd rather not feel this way. I'd rather have him as a friend and uh, 
because he's brilliant, he really contributes a lot to my to our presence together. But uh, it just and it just overwhelmingly bugs me that 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 he talks, you know, and what he has to say, I really value. But there's just too much of it. Have you? Um, so we could go either way. And I find what a lot of people do, me included sometimes, is to get stuck in this muddled middle where we're neither really moving out into spacious lovingness nor burrowing into asserting ourselves, speaking up as appropriate, right? So I just kind of want to explore those. I know you as someone who can is very benign and loving and spacious, so I'm I'm going to pursue a little bit the matter of actual assertion. So have you asserted yourself to him? Have you named it? Have you made requests in skillful ways? I got I got passive aggressive with him. I, I, I decided, you know, I just wasn't going to hang out with him anymore. I didn't resolve it at all. And that's not really particularly like me. But I've never, uh, he's, a, he's a unique person. So I'm, I I didn't get the answer. Have you basically described what he does and in some kind of a skillful way made a request that he do less of it? No, I haven't. I haven't done any of that. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you should because sometimes it's not safe or it's not worth it or we can see already. So, but why not? What do you think about doing that? Uh, I guess it's just, just become habitual. And uh, it's it's such a it's such a uh, hmm. I don't know I I just got in the habit of of, of withdrawing. Yeah, and it's not t- particularly uh, typical of me at all. Yeah, I don't think. So can I can I ask you to do a little thought experiment, a little live? You know, thanks for being willing to do this, Jerry. Um, if we imagine, if you imagine that the thing you want from him and the thing that bothers you, can you re- relate to it like you're cherishing it? Like Jane Hirschfield clearly is cherishing the bee and the smell of the lavender. All right. In other words, if, it, if you let it really matter to you that this bothers you and it's unfair, right? This is your need. Yeah. So I'm just saying, imagine that this this particular need that you have or desire that you have, that it's a particular, that, oh, you cherish it. Oh, oh. Now we can go too far with that. I got it, but you did not go far enough with it, right? So what would ha- what happens when you really treat what it's like to be you around this guy who just keeps over talking you. You know, um, just, just even naming it feels like it's beginning to unravel. Yeah. Resolve itself. But I could see, I could see sharing and it being well received also. I don't know. Yeah. You know, that's the, the kind of gamble. That's right. Now I'm not saying what to do and um, I'm just making a point that's not, that I that I think where there's opportunity and value a lot is moving to both poles. They seem opposed to each other, but they really support each other. The vastness and the particular, you know, the specific. And sometimes people are so caught up, you know, like their fist is knotted around the specific thing they want. They need to be served by moving more to the pole of spaciousness filled with a kind of you know goodwill a good good wishing a lot of other people i think including people who have been socialized to be nice and to avoid conflict uh, and to put uh, the needs of others first for various reasons they could be really served i think by moving into a cherishing of their of their of their unmet need and what matters to them much as jane hirschfield has moved into a cherishing of her friend and and the bee. Yeah, I think the niceness and the stuffing it down is kind of feeling my aliveness to some degree. Yeah, yeah. And I, I appreciate just one step 
of, of naming it really, really uh, takes me to a place that I can, I can start cherishing his friendship or at least be open to yeah. letting in who he is somehow. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, and to be clear, uh, and then I want to see, so I think this is really helpful to take these sort of, this might seem abstract or, you know, fuzzy abstract. things. Oh. Yeah, okay. But to bring it down, Jerry, like you helped us is great. And I want to, in a moment, get to UK. Um, I just want to say, I think one of the pitfalls, you know, what I'm describing as really identifying the specific and even if it's been absent for you, bringing a kind of making it matter, and and I'm seeing Donna make a good comment here um, about it. You know, we can go too far with that. I'm talking about balance, and I'm talking about combining the two. This sort of, for me, this is the essence of so much Dharma in a profound way. It's it's like vastness and particular. But, you know, it's like everything and something together. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. So, Kay, I'm asking you to unmute. Um, asking you to unmute. Great. Okay, Kay. Yes. Hi. Um, I have an older brother who's a couple years older than I. We're both in our early 70s. And um, most of his personal assets are in um, a brokerage account, and he has those under TOD. And I've tried to engage him. He has two grown kids and grandchildren. <laughs> he has no will. He has no medical power of attorney. He doesn't What's the question? To... Yeah, so the question is, every time I try to gently touch on those issues, he says, I don't need another mother. Shut up. So what's your stake in the in this? Why why are you involved? Out of well, pure benevolence, or do you have some material self-interest at stake here? No, it, it it no, I have no material self-interest. It has, but I'm pretty close to my his grand his kids and his grandkids. And um I had to go through my father's uh through probate and everything and i know how complicated it is and there's always something that comes up and i've tried to um communicate that this is a gift to your children to look at this as something you're also bequeathing them and he just tells right. me to shut up <laughs> okay i got it so what do you want so to do my about question it? is yeah do I just sit back and let it go? You know, I've done my best. I think yeah. really tried hard yeah. uh, to be gentle yeah. and compassionate, but um, somebody's going to get left with a big load of, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, it it's a blessing and a curse <laughs> to see that, to have the superpowers that can see train wrecks coming, right? And it's a blessing and a curse. And um uh, I don't know the particulars, and I find what's helpful is to uh, really kind of sort out the initial question I asked. You know, what is based? To what extent do you have some like material interest in the in the game? Like your own inheritance will be affected, or things like that. And then, and then, then we move on to okay, what are my duties to others? Right, and uh, it sounds like you you feel a duty to inform. And you have really fulfilled that duty. And can you give yourself, you know, the kind of end cycle on fulfilling a duty to inform, in a sense? And, um, you know, you might want to, you have to ask yourself if you're willing to take the, the kind of interpersonal risks in this. But, you know, in principle, if you feel like you have a duty to inform his kids, who will end up with a load of, you know what, as you put it, um, you know, do you want to exercise that? Or is, how can I put it, is your reasonable, um, appropriate self-interest in not getting into a ruckus with your brother in his remaining years, uh, does that kind of override your duty to his kids? 
who are not dummies, I assume. They're adults. Uh, they're probably, you know, pushing in middle age somewhere. You know, they've been around the block. Uh, you know, if they're not prepared to talk with their dad about his estate and the rest of it, so, well, that's kind of on them. You might conclude that. But this is a way to think about it. We're weighing duties, and and I find it's really helpful. I, I have a friend who's a medical ethicist at the highest level. You know, like the Pope has him come to the Vatican to talk about when is brain death and stuff like that. And we, he's my original, my very first rock climbing partner, stayed friends. And so it's really interesting to tease apart many issues that are actually ethical issues at bottom, right? And to just tease them up. That's how they do it. So they're trying to decide: is it what do we do to do we turn off life support? What what do we do when it's a teenager who's got an incurable illness and wants life support to be turned off, but their parents don't? What do you do when the teenager is 17 and a half years old? What do you do when the teenager just turned 13? And it really helps to kind of tease it apart. That would, that would be my my thing. But well, I appreciate um, it. Yeah, all that stuff's hanging out there and yeah. it's going to fall on someone, not me. So thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, and um, you know, and it may be given your in analytic intelligence and incisiveness, it it may also be that where the value a lot is in the spaciousness, you know, that consideration. Anyway, I wish you well with the K. And well, no, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. I not spoken up before. And um, yeah. I thought, well, it's time to ask a question. So I hope it was appropriate. Oh, it's fantastic and great. And I wish you well with it. And um, I appreciate that. Me, I'm very grateful to people with good intentions who stick their noses into things for the sake of all of us. <laughs> all right. Okay, good. Larry, I'm going to, you bet. I'm going to ask you to unmute, Larry. There you are. Um, great. Good to see you. And yeah, no, really uh, hit home. Um, I love that. The combination of starting with the spaciousness, right? And then yeah. going deep. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I just want to share a little bit. I think a few months back, I shared also about my relationship with my young adult daughter. And yeah. and I, um, and I think there's some other skills or suggestions that you've made that also relate to this but the the um she and i just wind up in this rut and yeah. pattern and it it's sort of and and i know i'm complicit in it you know <laughs> because it takes two and 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 it's around i think each of us having to be right and it's usually about something very like trivial you know um and it's been going on for, for so long and it sneaks up on you on me yeah it's like oh, uh, oh oh how did i get here and in like one minute you know we're we're heading south and and yep. um so oh, yeah. so my so my so my question is so you know, is how to be more skillful in those moments. Yep. I relate. Got an adult son and daughter. So quick, I got to, so I, I'll zoom in if it's okay. Thanks again. I've been watching speed chess lately, so watch out. But anyway, um, uh, so a couple things for me. One uh, is I find that in certain relationships, it's so helpful to decide for yourself. Uh, I'll put it a certain way. Like as a therapist, if I run into a client of mine in the supermarket, I'd never take my therapist hat off. I'm appropriate. You know, I'm relaxed. I'm not uptight. I don't run around a corner, you know, and so forth. Because, you know, but I, I always, you know, I, for me, it's really important. Never take your therapist hat off. Same thing. Never take your dad hat off or your husband hat. If you, in my case, I'm married. And um, I find that's really helpful. Like what's your fundamental stance? And with adult kids, it's so easy to take our parent hat off. And particularly sometimes because they say, you know, you're, you're actually like my parent. But deep down, we're always gonna be their parent. And they're always gonna have expectations about that. And there's just, it's kind of like taking refuge. You're still a being, 
but fundamentally can you rest in if it unless they have so mistreated you that they've scorched the earth which is you know then you're in a different world but that's kind of the nuclear option to use as a parent where you just you just didn't, you know but that's very extreme otherwise for me it's you know I'm not saying what you should do but it's been really helpful for me to just kind of keep that hat on just like I I just want to keep my Buddhist hat on in a sense I don't want to be a wanker uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be a jerk uh, like your non-jerk hat on <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> where you just have a stance that I'm just not going to go there you know, like you're playing, I don't know why I'm thinking of tennis. I never, I mean, I was a bad tennis player where I'm just not going to be that person who calls the ball out when I know it hit the line. Even if the other person thinks it was out and they, even if the referee saw, no, it hit the line. I'm just not going to be that person. I don't want to be that person. So there's something there about in, when you go into a situation, you remind yourself and that sometimes it really helps to remember what they were like when they were little. And then the other thing is to think about um, <clears throat> basically um, never creating an aversive experience for them. So a little technical stuff. We form our expectations based on history. So now if our history is that one in four interactions with dad are end up being unpleasant from my point of view, then I've got a 25% chance that the next interaction is going to be a drag. I'm going to tend to avoid interactions, which is horrible because as you know, older parents with adult kids, the last thing in the world we want is for them to withdraw from us, right? So depends. <laughs> yeah. Then you can make a commitment from your standpoint, which is I'm going to zero, zero interactions that are aversive from their standpoint. And just go after it, zero, zero out. Now that doesn't mean letting them abuse you, and you know, I'm not talking about that. But I'm just talking about the stupid stuff where we argue a point, or um, I think it's okay to say it. So we were having my wife and I were talking with our daughter yesterday, and and it was it was nice, it was sweet, and we were joking about filing um, the necessity of filing a more complicated tax return if you get paid more than $600 from a company and they issue a 1099 to you and now you need to file a Schedule C. And we were kind of laughing at the ways in which she tries to avoid certain kinds of income because that'll require a more complicated tax return. <laughs> you know what I mean? And okay, and I was just sort of to laugh about it because to me, and then I could, and then she said, basically, I don't want to talk about it. And I was like, Shot across the bow, do not, and, and me instantly, I, I turned it into something lighter and joked, and we changed the subject and woof, no aversive experiences. That's something to think about. And it has to do with what your stakes are. Obviously, out of service and love, right, but what's your own self interest? You know, really zeroing in. And I'll actually say that I find that. Um, Having a kind of, speaking of chess, which I'm watching these days, not that I'm any good at it, uh, you know, looking at the game three, four, five moves ahead. They said that, okay, if I say this, what's going to happen next? Don't say it. <laughs> okay. I got to keep going. Is that okay? Thank, yes. Thank you. Okay. And that kind of meticulous attention. That's not about muzzling yourself. Mm. It's about retaining a freedom that you're not um, dragged into saying stupid stuff. Then you're not free. You know what I mean? We think, oh, it's my reactions. I got to speak my truth. No, it's a robotic reaction that's just dragging you like a cruise missile, you know, robotically into doing something that's not in your best interest. So if I could sum, sum up in one or two sentences what I'm hearing from you is owning being a parent, yeah. and then I don't have to argue with her because I, I don't have to be right. You know, I'm the parent right. and I don't have to convince her that I'm right. If yeah. she feels a need, go ahead. Yeah, and just yeah. your spaciousness, your lovingness. You're this benevolent dad who just loves her like crazy. And you're just sort of rested in that. Not a deal. Okay, all right. 
All right. So glad to have a chance to talk with you, Elizabeth. This is great. Okay, first Charmaine. Uh, I know we're wrapping up here. Okay, Charmaine asking you to unmute. By the way, if you see the notes in the chat from Elizabeth McDowell, who's coming up here in the queue, you're next in the batter's box, I think. I've been watching baseball movies too. Um, Elizabeth's stuff is awesome in the chat. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, um, Charmaine. Um, I have a friend who I love very much. I've known him for 25 years. He has an alcohol problem. And I can't fix it, but I, I have core beliefs about being open and honest. Uh -huh. And I feel you and Kay. <laughs> yeah, go on in good ways. Good ways. Good um, ways. I, 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 you know, I, whenever I've approached it with him, he deny it. But that's his disease. And, you know, I'm a therapist myself, not with him, but professionally. And, um, it, it, you know, uh, there's the part of me that knows when to stay away from that. But yeah, what's uh, your question? Am I being honest by maintaining the relationship? Yeah. Knowing he is denying it. Yeah. What I've been doing, I mean, I thought he was had stopped because, yeah. well, no, the way I dealt with it is I never brought it up. So can I just jump in? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that a, a good question is, let's assume that you are protecting your own self-interest. You're not letting him, you know, you're not talking with him when he's drunk and it's annoying. You're not being in situations where he's creating a scene. Uh, right. So let's assume he's that. a binge. He's a binge alcoholic. Yeah. Let's assume you're take you're protecting yourself. Let's assume you've done that. So duty to self has been fulfilled and kind of follow how I'm structuring this. So what's your duty to yourself? You have fulfilled it. You're protecting yourself. You're not lying about what you see to yourself. You're okay. To myself is also, uh, being honest about what I see. I guess I've already done that. Well, you're I? you're you're honest with yourself now. Do you this is interesting. Do you feel you have to say it because you see it? And, I have already. Yeah. Well and just because we see it doesn't necessarily mean we have to say it, right? But okay. Now the question is duty to him and to some extent that you've named your truth. It seems like you've notified him. You've sent the message. You you have, and but he is it honest? Want... Yeah, is it honest? Am I being honest in the relationship if I let it alone and am with him when he's sober? Yeah, you know the conflict. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's a personal. So, the, but I think the question is clear. In other words, and forgive me for jumping in. You know, because we're we're over time. Um, you want him not to drink. Yeah. Yeah. And so the question is, are you being honest with him about your desire that he doesn't drink? And I find the word honest to be kind of tricky because um, we can be honest while not saying all kinds of things we think or see, right? We're not lying about them. We're just not saying them. Just to say that. But what I'm hearing is that you're really wrestling with, um, are you being true to yourself to not push on him pretty firmly to get sober? Right? That's what you're, that's what I'm hearing you kind of wrestle with. Am and, I being, am I being true to myself? If yeah. I don't push, uh, I don't uh, yeah. push on him. On yeah. And that's a tough call. That's a tough call. I, I don't know. Um, I think you might, I think there are people who've done a lot, who have a lot of wisdom about this in Al-Anon and people who've been down that road a long time. Um, I, I know. Um, it's. I, um, I feel like for myself, what I do, and I'll finish on this, I guess, I just say for myself, I kind of clarify in my mind, you know, 
the shots I'm going to take. And then after that, I feel it's just out of my hands, you know? And um, so I, I have a friend who drinks too much and he has a, he's discovered recently he has a serious medical issue that's aggravated by alcohol. And, you know, but up to this point, our conversation about it was fairly, you know, like he knows he has a problem and I said, yeah, you have a problem. And uh, now it's kind of like I'm raising the stakes because he's my friend. But I'm only going to raise the stakes a couple of times. And then after that, you know, I'm not going to bug him about it pretty much because I feel like it's not going to have an effect. So I, I decide for myself how far I'm going to go. And you might want to clarify for yourself how far you're going to go. I don't know. But that's, yeah, I wish you well with all this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. you hurt for someone totally. because the potential is there. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's that feeling of, of feeling all these years that I made a difference in his life yeah. as a friend and as, you know, the person yeah. I am. And then I see he binged again and it's like, uh, I, I'm going on, but no, I totally get it. Just, and the, um, other, the other side it's of it, just though, sad. Yeah. The, the other side that balances what I'm saying. Yeah. The, the other side of it. So in other words, we can keep trying to change people who just are not going to change. And in fact, our effort to get them to change in a funny kind of way helps them perpetuate because it offloads responsibility onto others on the one hand. On the other hand, there's a long line of people out the door whose lives were changed by a friend who absolutely laid it on the line with them in a fierce and uncompromising and sustained way. So both. Okay, finishing with Elizabeth. Okay, yeah, good. Best to you, Charmaine. Bows back. Okay, Elizabeth. Great. Great, great, great. Yeah, good. Hi. So I feel so bad for her because I that situation led to my mental health struggle of trying to save an addict. So been there. Yeah. I a lot of compassion. There's a lot of pain point there. Yeah. Um, my question, it goes along with mine. It's like, I wish they'd have class consciousness. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm on the opposite side where it's a parent that has a blind point. And ironically, the one that got me into Buddhism and all that, you know, grew up on Joseph Campbell and Apocalypse Now. <laughs> um, and uh, I see the othering happen and I don't know what to do about it. And it started a long, a long time ago because I wasn't a Christian, but um, the next step was when I was involved in um, protests and made the comment that um, when one of the protesters got run over, well, they should stay out of the road or something like that. And I just looked at him and I was like, that could be me or the kids, you know, why, why would you say something like that? It was just horrifying. And so when you see that othering happening to yourself, do you try to humanize yourself to that person? Or, I mean, it's hard to just go, hey, let's talk about football, you know, <laughs> after that kind of conversation. Or, you know, maybe if you weren't there, you wouldn't have been shot and, and just stuff like that, where it's just like, this is basic humanness. And you're, and I've, I've always been, you know, the other and dehumanized. So it's just like, I'm the most hated person in my county. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. it's one of those things where, when it's your parent, it's kind of like, how, how do you remove yourself from it and be like, this is dad and not the political spectrum he's fallen into via the, you know, Rush Limbaugh era forward? Well, if I follow you right, there's um, several things come to mind, right? Um, one is that there's a in there's a <clears throat> an inherent pain as 
social primates. When <clears throat> others turn us into an it to their I, you know, the I thou structure, I it structure, or they other us, as you put it. And of course it it's it lands on us. And it, it's important to I think acknowledge that as you are, Elizabeth. You're already there. I'm just naming it for us in general. There's that's one part of it. And then after we we feel the jolt of that, especially when it comes out of left field, right? Uh, we're just startled. Then what do we do? And it seems to me that what we can do is to thou ourselves, you know, to be to to just know that we're we're. Uh, for me, a saying recently has rose in my mind: every person is a being. To recognize our own beingness, whatever they do, right? And then we look at them. And sometimes it's appropriate to just uh, refuse to be um, itted, as you do, you know, as you said to them, essentially, or refuse to have somebody else be itted, like that protester who was run over is someone's daughter, you know, potentially someone's mother, someone's sister, maybe someone's partner, right? It's a real person, someone's friend, right? That's a real person there. Um, and so sometimes we do that. And I personally feel that there is a value that I believe that people should uh, aspire to, to some extent, to basically stand up for what is right and to to bear witness to what is true. And then there's the question of how and when, and sometimes you, we choose not to because we're just outnumbered or it's pointless. They're just trolling us. Uh, but where we look at someone with a kind of moral quality, like, really? You know? And it sometimes shocks other people who just had a habit. They repeat some phrase they heard on Fox News or wherever. And, and you go, really? And, and in that moment of your real contact with them, they they break up. They they wake up from the spell, in which they're just mouthing lines that turn others into its. And then last though, sometimes you realize that other people are just committed to a certain view. I've been in half a cult, and I think there's a lot of people um, who are in a functioning cult, of a kind of a political cult certainly in America, and you just realize, oh, they're in the cult. You know what I mean? And I know a lot of nice people who are in cults. They're wonderful till you get them talking about the cult. You know what I mean? <laughs> you can have a picnic with them. You can have a beer with them. You can watch sports. You can, kids can play in the same schools, and then they'll do stuff, and you'll just suddenly realize, oh, okay, I got it. You believe that the earth is flat and that you know um, aliens are living on the other side. I don't know, something like that, or the equivalent. Yeah. And you just kind of go, yeah, okay. And you quit banging your head against that wall. So for me, these are the steps that I personally go through. And um, I, I find that <clears throat> there's this sweet spot. I'm going to finish on this point. There's this sweet spot where we just keep returning to our own non-specific, unconditional stance. How do you want to be in this life? How do you want to be, right? And we just kind of rest in it. And um, we get less and less preoccupied with what's happening in the minds of other people. If you look at a fair number of the comments in the chat and the issues, it's we get upset about what's in the minds of other people because that has consequences. I get it about consequences. But if you start to realize I can't change what's in their minds, you know, but what I can do is just kind of abide in a wholesome, decent place in which I'm doing what I can do, then we can get a lot more peaceful, I find. We, we can, you know what I mean? We can get on, you know, like the, the think of how much fiction is about quests. Do you like reading fantasy? Do you like reading mythic stuff? It's a quest, various kinds, right? Um, and we just get caught up in the quest for the grail of one kind or another, and yet, 
we're never going to get Rapunzel to let down her hair. You know, we're never going to defeat that dragon. We just, we're never, we're never going to, you know, get the ring of power from smog. It's just, it's a waste. And we just give up after a while trying to make something happen in the minds of others. Definitely. So. And I can see that. Um, it's kind of weird how it, how I grew up the daddy's girl and how he raised me to stand up for myself and others and then shocked <laughs> when I did it. Um, but yeah, maybe lead by example type thing because me going to therapy got a bunch of other, my family members yeah. in therapy. And so I've seen their lives change and stuff. So maybe it's just a long, yeah. more treacherous road for that one. Yeah. I think that's true. And, and just living by example, you know, just being a fundamentally decent person like you are, obviously. And, uh, you know, you, you leave socialist me. propaganda in his bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. <laughs> anyway, well, finishing for sure. Uh, you may know this story. It's a true story. And it's in a Buddhist context, but we could take it out of that particular context. Basically, um, uh, a woman, it's a true story, uh, from a family much like yours. Sounds like fairly conservative, fundamentalist, maybe, you know, religious, uh, something like that, traditional, let's say, uh, in the South of America, goes off to a three-month meditation retreat, uh, you know, and hanging out with a bunch of aging hippies there. And uh, retreat ends, and she's kind of worried, uh, like, I, wow, I'm going to go home to the, what am I going to go home to? How are they going to react to me? Uh How's it going to be? And so forth. And uh, then she goes home. And uh, about a month later, she writes a letter to the teachers who said, yeah, write us. Tell us how it's going after you get home. Uh, so she writes this letter. And uh, the gist of it is that she said in the letter, you know, uh, my family hates it when I'm Buddhist, but they love it when I'm a Buddha. I like that. Yeah, translate that in whatever ways makes sense to you. you know? Yeah. Okay. Bows to you all. Oh, I should have said this from the start. I'm going to be gone for four weeks. I'm traveling in Europe, and I'm going to have a two-week vacation in Grindelwald at the base of the Eiger. And if you don't know what that's about, watch Clint Eastwood try to climb it. Anyway, uh, and so... Um, uh, so, but we have a lineup of fantastic guest teachers. I will be back. I will be back. And last and not least, I really encourage you to check out this workshop that I'm putting in the, uh, the chat again, this Compassion in Conflict workshop. It'll be a fundraiser for the Compassion Coalition, full of value, three hours. I'm doing it a week from Saturday, uh, and I hope you're there. Okay. 